Welcome to all our panelists and attendees. I am Hila Levy, and I am delighted to be hosting this event today on behalf of New America's Digital Impact and Governance Initiative, where I am a program fellow working to identify best practices for open, equitable technology use across linguistic ability and cultural boundaries. Over the next hour, we will learn more about how society can benefit from digital public infrastructure that is both more accessible and inclusive of all citizens and users. Governments, corporations, organizations, and their audiences, customers, and citizens all hope to communicate, connect, and engage with each other effectively. However, not all platforms and tools are made equally. And thinking through inclusive and accessible design from the outset can reap large-scale benefits for all. Today, we hope to help governments, contracting specialists, international organizations, technologists, programmers, developers, and designers consider some best practices to achieve inclusive and equitable digital infrastructure that can have wider reach and benefit. Considering these issues early in the funding, design, and development processes will save time, money, and effort during any future scaling and bolster participation, reach, and utility. As part of this event, I will first introduce everyone and then kick off with some discussion questions around the room, trying to get to the heart of these important issues. For our audience, we will be recording this event and following it up with a written blog that will include additional resources. If you are watching live, please feel free to follow our conversation on social media using the hashtag digital inclusion and follow us at digi, D-I-G-I underscore New America on Twitter. It is now my great pleasure and to introduce our accomplished panelists. Here from New America is our senior advisor, Cecilia Munoz, a longtime public policy leader who has steered our organization and other boards and nonprofits towards more inclusive, evidence-based policies. Among her many roles and experiences, Cecilia has had the distinction of serving as the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Director of the Domestic Policy Council under President Obama. She was a MacArthur Fellow and spent 20 years at the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos US, the nation's largest Hispanic policy and advocacy organization. Welcome, Cecilia. I am also thankful to have Jenny Leigh Fleury, Microsoft's Chief Accessibility Officer featured today. For over 16 years, Jenny has been pioneering the way tech companies envision accessibility, not only for their own employees, but for their users worldwide. She has an amazing story of resilience and representation that has now been shared with hundreds of thousands of viewers through massive open online courses on diversity and inclusion in the workplace, hackathons, and industry conferences, including the annual Microsoft Ability Summit. Her work has been recognized by the White House as a Disability Employment Champion of Change, among other honors. Thank you so much, Jenny. Next, we have Dion Woods-Bell, currently the Senior Advisor for Global Policy and Financial Services for the Poor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. She is a highly experienced international attorney who has also worked in the private sector for the Federal Trade Commission, in civil society, and the nonprofit space. Dion's efforts are helping to build coalitions and lift up marginalized communities, including women, work that often requires technological platforms and solutions. Dion, thank you so much for joining us. I'm also honored to introduce Samantha Mack, calling in from Alaska today. Samantha has done a wealth of work in her short years across government, civil society, and academia, particularly ensuring indigenous representation. Samantha currently serves as the State of Alaska Elections Language Assistance Compliance Manager, ensuring citizens can more fully participate in our democracy in their own languages. Samantha also teaches Alaska Native Literature at her alma mater, the University of Alaska at Anchorage, after being the university's first and the first Alaska Native Rhodes Scholar. It is a pleasure to have you here, Samantha, as we celebrate the UN International Day of Indigenous Peoples. Finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Tamika Tillman, the Executive Director of the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative at New America, where he works with governments and corporations worldwide 
to develop technology solutions to public problems. Prior to joining New America, he served as a senior advisor to Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry Sr. at the State Department and Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you again to all of our panelists and all of our audience members. I am really looking forward to our discussion. First, I would like to very briefly come back to you, to Micah, to set the stage. New America has been focused on the concept of digital public goods and infrastructure, which is a new approach to solving problems. Can you explain what a digital public good is and some examples of how these might provide and improve public administration and government services? Why are these so critical worldwide as we move into the future? Tamika? Well, thank you very much, Hila. It's wonderful to be with you and this amazing crew of panelists and congratulations on pulling this uh, marvelous discussion together. Uh, digital public goods and digital infrastructure are a relatively new idea uh, in terms of uh, the way we're putting them into practice, but they have deep roots. If you go back to the earliest days of the internet, many of the individuals who were involved in creating uh, the modern internet envision that we would have public goods and public infrastructure available in the same way that we have roads and parks in the real world that everyone can take for granted that everyone takes for granted and everyone can access and the assumption was which uh, i think has proven out that access to public infrastructure in the digital space would make it easier for everyone across society to gain access to the goods and services and opportunities that are available in the digital realm. Now, we did not build that infrastructure in the United States, and we have ended up with a situation where in many instances, in order to do even the most basic activities online, whether it's sending a message or sending resources or payment uh, or uh, identifying yourself, you need to work through a third party intermediary. And many times those intermediaries use the information we provide to try and manipulate our behavior and convince us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. It's not a great situation. What we are seeing fortunately is that in a number of countries around the world, there is a new approach and it is grounded in this concept of digital public goods and digital infrastructure. The idea is that if you can build out open platforms that address critical challenges, such as the need to identify oneself, the ability to send resources back and forth, the ability to move data uh, across society, then you can unlock enormous opportunity and enormous functionality for a whole lot of people uh, in a way that's very efficient and very affordable. The early results on this are pretty breathtaking. In Kenya, we've seen 2% of the population lifted out of poverty as a result of access to a nationwide payment system. Uh, in Bangladesh, they've saved about 2 billion days of time that were previously being wasted. Uh, and in Estonia, 2% of GDP each year is recouped by access to these systems, by virtue of access to these systems. So there's some really extraordinary benefits associated with this approach. And increasingly, there is interest in pursuing this strategy, not only in the United States, but in open societies more broadly, as a mechanism for building out an alternative to what has become a pretty broken digital status quo. Uh, and so that is the impetus for the work that uh, our team has been involved in at, at New America. We've been fortunate to have you and other incredible uh, partners in, in that effort. Uh, and uh, as a, a matter of personal privilege, since uh, this is my last event with New America, and I'll be moving to a new role very soon, uh, I just want to thank uh, all of the members of our team and Cecilia and the leadership of New America uh, for doing uh, just extraordinary, extraordinary work over the last few years to build out this vision to a point where it is now gaining much broader adoption and acceptance. Uh, and folks like Allison Price and Jordan Sandman and Anne-Marie Slaughter have been instrumental uh, in helping us to get to the point where we are. So with that as backdrop, I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you so much, Jamaica, and you will certainly be missed. The work that you've done has really been influential in building alliances across the world and helping to assemble this team that we have here today. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Cecilia now. Um, Cecilia, 
across your career, you have seen how important it is for government, civic society, and nonprofits to interface effectively with their citizens and audiences. So how does our present reliance on digital technology shape how we plan for engagement with each and every citizen? Thank you, Gila, for the question and for pulling together the event. I'm really honored to be here with this amazing group of panelists. And just I'll just echo my thanks to Tamika for your work at New America and our, though we will miss you, our excitement for the work that's still ahead of you. Um, the, this is an incredibly important topic because the government's ability to effectively reach the people that it serves is fundamental to, to really the strength of the democracy. I mean, it really boils down to that. And I think we've had a lot of lessons in, in the United States, and that's just, this is not unique to the United States in recent years, uh, uh, about what it means when the government fails to effectively reach everyone. And I, I think sometimes one of the mistakes that we make is we assume that the existence of the technology means that everyone can access it. And that's of course not always the case, right? We make assumptions for, or, and we've made assumptions, for example, in this really difficult year that we are all, you know, hopefully coming out of, I knock on wood as I say that, um, right? That everybody has, has uh, similar access to broadband, for example, in order for, you know, children to receive an education in the kind of year that we've come out of. And we know that that's not the case. So access to the technology is an issue. And then the design of technology is, absolutely essential to making sure that we reach the people who need to be reached. So the child tax credit, which the current administration, for example, is administering, uh, has the potential to reduce child poverty by half. Um, that prediction assumes 100% take up of the child tax credit as well as another policy. And those policies have never had 100% participation. So we can't assume that the technology itself will mean access. We have to design it in such a way that it is informed by the people we are trying to reach so that, and make sure that government is designing with and not for just for in order to make sure that we're, we're able to reach every person in every corner of this country. I think those are all great point, Cecilia. And you've done a lot of this work yourself at the grassroots level, advocating for those parts of the population that might not otherwise have easy access to the rights and benefits and information to which they were entitled. So what are some of the barriers to connecting with underserved communities, at least then when you were doing that work? And how has technology created new opportunities to overcome these? What would you suggest people do to, to overcome those barriers? Um, so it's a great question. I mean, there are obvious barriers like um, language, for example, there are hundreds of languages spoken in the United States in addition to English. And for some communities, it's easier to access information in, in other languages. There are uh, challenges associated with geographic isolation. So there's some kind of obvious obstacles. And then there are obstacles that are more subtle and that differ from community to community. Um, for example, um, uh, when uh, in communities where people are more likely to live in multi-generational households, they may miss out um, based on the way that policies are constructed, assuming a certain kind of family architecture and a certain, assuming a certain kind of household architecture. Um, so that's why it is really, it's essential for policymakers to, to reflect and be drawn from the communities that we're trying to serve. But it's also important that policymakers are spending um, as much time listening and engaging and being deliberate structures that, that actually reach them. And frankly, I this with all humility as a maker myself, uh, that policymakers have to have the humility to both measure their results and recognize when they're getting it wrong. I think these are all great points and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing some of Samantha's uh, comments as we move into her portion of the discussion, especially on integrating um, different languages into, into platforms. And I just want to point out for our audience that we'll be highlighting some of these resources specific to designers and to developers in our, in our write-up and in our blog, um, so we can all share and reference those. But Cecilia, we talked about, you mentioned some apps and you mentioned multi-generational multi households. Um, and it wasn't uncommon to see media reports of these cross-cultural or intergenerational gaps 
when we're looking at fiscal benefits this past year and vaccination access, it's so difficult to access services when you don't know how to use a smartphone well, or you can't understand the language of an app. So what can we do to improve rollouts of information campaigns or public benefits to avoid those issues in the future? Is, is there anything that you could suggest in terms of those culturally relevant campaigns or designing for multilingual communities? Yeah. The, and I, I feel like I have a lot of scars um, on this particular topic because we, we learned so much, frankly, from the rollout of the Affordable Care Act and the Obama administration, both from the things that went wrong as well as from the things that went right. Um, the, you cannot assume that an informational rollout, that, that, that outreach alone is sufficient, although your outreach has to be well informed by the ways in which communities gather information. Um, I'll refer, for example, to the work of an organization called ECIS, run by a friend of mine named Stephanie Valencia, that's been doing very important research into the Latino community and found, for example, that a lot of us got our political information and our information in general from YouTube, which is brand new information, something that wasn't known to the government, it wasn't necessarily known to the folks who were campaigning in the community. That is, if you are somebody who's trying to get shots in people's arms, or vital information about how to access the child tax credit, for example, that piece of information is essential because you could be paying a lot of money to put ads on buses or do uh, you know, television advertising, for example, that is gonna completely miss the target audience because you haven't um, gone deep enough to understand how that audience is actually getting its information. The same is true for whatever the technological interfaces that we are assuming people will be able to access. It's not enough to build the thing, you have to design the thing in a way which is, which is that in which you have tested can reach the people that you intend to reach. Thank you, Cecilia. I know we're gonna come back to these topics across the discussion. So thank you for kicking us off on that. Um, I wanna turn it over to Jenny uh, now, Jenny from Microsoft. You've spent your life finding ways to adapt to a world that wasn't always built with you in mind. Um, and in your current work as the chief accessibility officer of one of the world's largest companies, you're leading significant changes to the status quo when it comes to how diverse users with differing abilities engage with technology. But most firms don't have such a position. So what top practices can you share with us that any team or organization can adopt to increase accessibility when designing the user experience? So thank you for having me and, and thank you for this incredible panel. I know I'm taking notes as people are talking. You know, I, I think I'm going to lean a little bit on some of the comments that have already been said. I'm a chief accessibility officer. I'm actually the second for Microsoft. I came out of the tech industry and I'm thrilled to say that there are far more of them now than there were 10 years ago, but there's still a massive opportunity. It came out of the tech industry because we really recognized well, a couple of really key and important things. The area of disability is a massive demographic. It's just huge. It's over a billion people in the world. And the CDC just said it's around 26% of the US population. That's big. Um, and with an aging population, and then you add on to that uh, things like a gorgeous pandemic with long COVID just being recognized by the US government as a disability. It's a growing demographic. And then from a technical perspective, we are using digital products every day, all day. But do you know if they're accessible? Uh, if you don't know that your email with an image in it is accessible, it's not. There's no in between. Um, and so you then have a decision to make. Do you consciously include or do you unconsciously exclude? Inclusion is a far better path. And that's really where people in my kind of role, leadership positions in companies, really take a, a point of being proactive about how to include and infuse accessibility into the design of products, whether that's Microsoft Office or an Xbox controller. Um, and I don't think it's a tech industry thing anymore. It's incumbent on us all because we are all far more digital and we're going to be that way around the world and it's continuing to evolve and grow. So it's really that core principle of you uh, design with and design for. Don't think you know what a person with a disability needs. Build the community and um, build that base of talent and expertise around you. So you are building with people with disabilities. You're building with the experts. 
Um, and then you're quite simply going to get a better product. That's where most of accessibility has come from. Captioning came from the deaf, talking books came from designing for the blind. And now look at where that's gone. So you're not just going to solve the inclusion gap. You could also create something really cool um, in the process. So it's, I think it's incumbent on us all. You're absolutely right, Jenny. This is something that um, maybe not all of our audience is familiar with. People know that accessibility is the law in many countries. And of course, it's the right thing to do. But sometimes it's, it's really easy to get hung up on costs during the design process and then leave out those accessible features. So what is your advice for our audience worldwide on thinking about inclusive or universal design in a new way? Um, people are always talking about return on investment, but it's more than that. Could you elaborate a little bit? If the conversation is about why should I do it for the 4% who are deaf for the uh, for this metric and where's the ROI, that is quite bluntly a trap. Um, and I would really purposefully move that conversation on. And that's a very reactive mentality. It's missing the opportunity that there is to design with and through and for disability. In fact, humanity. Uh, if we don't design with the spectrum of all of that we are, we're not we're going to miss out on the opportunity to create good things. And we're also not going to provide an equal playing field uh, for people to be productive in education, in employment, in participation in civic activities. These things are crucially, crucially important. So the conversation we have here all the time uh, is how can we open the doors? Um, and that is presuming one very important thing. Most doors are closed. Um, as someone who's deaf and has grown up deaf, and I speak beautifully for myself, I've still retained my British accent despite being over here now for 17 years um, in the States. I, everything that I go to, particularly with a masked world, those doors are closed to me. I have to self-identify and say, I'm sorry, I, I cannot understand you wearing a mask. I'm deaf, um, you know, please help me to be a part of this. And then you see different reactions. You see the people who turn to whoever's next to me and say, I'll work through that person. Or the person who says, hang on a minute, let me stand back, pull the mask down, does this help? That's the way we should be as a society. So the, the question shouldn't be, should I do this? It should be, how do I do this? And I would say it's far simpler than you think. Uh, in order to check a website, simple tools, you can just chuck on the toolbar and it will magically go through that website and give you a thumbs up. Um, it can also be uh, that you look at, um, you know, you look at uh, captioning, um, auto transcriptions, the quality is going up and up and up. That's some of what we're seeing in all these communications tool. Make sure that your videos are captioned. Make sure that you correct those videos and they're saying the words that you want. These things are not hard. They become part of how you do things. They're not additional cost. They just become a really important part of building and sharing anything that you want to. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I know you've just done so much work in opening this world up for those 1 billion people that really need this access to, to contribute to society just like anybody else. Um, whether their uh, disability is visible or hidden, as many are. Um, are there any resources that you might recommend for our audience? You've mentioned a toolbar, you've mentioned um, a few different uh, Microsoft products maybe. What, what would you recommend people just think about in their daily lives as they're going through the technology options available to them? Well, I'd, I'd be very quick first to point out that I'm one of thankfully a growing community of accessibility leaders, um, not just in the States, but around the world. There needs to be more. Uh, so I will put a plea out there to any company. If, again, if you don't know if it's accessible, it's not. So invest in that leadership. And so that every company does now have a pretty robust site that details magical features and apps and widgets that you can download. But for the nerds amongst us, yes, there's definitely a few things that I would say are intended purposefully to make life easier. All of ours are on our website, uh, microsoft.com slash accessibility. But just to mention a couple, one, 
I, I mentioned Accessibility Insights, which is that magical tool to check the accessibility of your website uh, or your app. But I would also mention Accessibility Checker. This lives in Office. It's right next to Spell Check. We put it there for a reason. So you can hit the button and it will check your document, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, and it will tell you how accessible that is and guide you on how best to fix it. Simple things really matter. We're now getting to the point where we're turning that on by default in the background. And that if you're sending out a large email, which let's be honest, we all do, it will prompt you gorgeously and politely. This is not accessible. You really do want to fix this, right? Um, before you click send. Um, so there are some really simple things in there. And then if you're a gamer, again, play is just as important as work. We know this. They know that we've done an enormous amount to expand the world of gaming for everyone. Um, and that includes a dedicated controller for people with mobility disabilities called the adaptive controller. So just know that we're one company of many, but there's a lot of information and we have a dedicated support team for our customers with disabilities that takes about 12, 13,000 calls a month. There's a big market out there and we want to see more people engage and use the tools because they and then tell us what else you need. Thank you so much, Jenny. I know you have opened a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's uh, toolbars today to help us think through what we can do better, all of us. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Dion now, because Dion, as we've just seen today, not everyone consumes and interacts with technology in the same way. And in the developing world, access to digital tools can be limited in some cases. Now, in your work at the Gates Foundation, you are at the forefront of propelling the world towards the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Many projects nowadays in development have a digital or an informational component. So how can thinking about inclusion at the outset during planning or pilot phases help philanthropists, technologists, aid organizations, and governments have greater effectiveness? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here today, especially on this important occasion and in such a very good company. Um, I wanna lean on just like Jenny, the remarks that were made earlier and also double down on the issues that Tamika put on the table. Um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we first got interested in digital financial inclusion when we were exploring new ways to address systemic causes of poverty, in particular in low and middle income countries. And we realized that there was a huge opportunity to make a difference by investing in innovations like mobile money, digital payment systems, which are safe, cheap, and easy for low income users to adopt, or so we hope. Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftershocks, we've been given additional perspective and insights into why inclusion at the outset of procuring technology is so important. And I'll call it inclusion by design. Many of my privacy geeks um, go along with me because we know privacy by de design, security by design, and we're gonna say, uh, let's go with inclusion by design. So economies around the world have experienced a dramatic slowdown due to, to the pandemic we've all lived. And even countries with limited initial incidence of the virus face severe economic aftershocks, especially as the renewed outbreaks pose threat to recovery. By making sure that emergency financial support could reach people quickly, uh, that becoming a priority for so many countries and so many governments, given lockdowns and social distancing, uh, this became an opportunity to have inclusion by design. So countries which had more invested in their financial systems and making them inclusive before the pandemic were more easily able to mitigate the aftershocks or the shocks of the pandemic. And the ability of these countries to act wasn't built on a radical reinvention, but rather on the use of effective and established solutions to drive digital growth and inclusion. And kind of like Jenny talked about, putting it there up front, up top, front and center, making sure that everybody could have access became a great opportunity for success. Of course, there's a limit to how much countries can expand financial financial access amid a crisis. So the time to upgrade financial policies, regulations, infrastructure, and technology to drive inclusion is prior to a crisis. Or if you're like us right now in the middle of the crisis, the time is now. 
We don't need to reinvent the wheel, like I said before, but to rebuild economies, um, to rebuild economies, we need to focus on digital financial inclusion. And so we need to do that with think, keeping in mind the other potential opportunities. Um, Jenny talked a little bit about universal design. So that when you have something for the benefit of one community, how that can become available to the entire population. So think climate change, think natural disasters, and think about the next pandemic, and think about inclusion by design. So first, countries should craft financial services policies and regulations that provide space for companies and industries to innovate while safeguarding consumers, risks, against, uh, consumers against risks, including data privacy and cybersecurity risks. And when countries get their financial sector policies right, the benefits of financial inclusion are accrue rapidly. There are a few examples. Um, Ghana's one, uh, they made changes and that benefited the entire population. I can give you more details as Hila pointed out uh, in our blog post, so stay tuned for that. And by upgrading financial services policies, that's only part of the solution. Uh, to build more pandemic resilient economies, that requires being able to identify people, including and especially women, uh, to trans transact and give them information and payments quickly. And we heard a little bit about social safety net payments earlier on. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, countries that have high levels of payment and ID connectivity could quickly identify households. I'll flag for you Thailand and India. And again, I'll be happy to come back with more concrete examples. Um, by contrast, countries with limited payment connectivity and identity systems had less effective options to and had to physically deliver cash. Not such a good idea in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, fortunately, governments seeking to upgrade their digital financial systems need not start from scratch. They can take advantage of open source payment and identity platforms such as MojaLoop and MOSIF built on best in class privacy and data protections. Um, those innovations are already accelerating digital financial inclusion approaches in several countries, including in Tanzania, Morocco, the Philippines, Ethiopia, and Guinea are also getting up, exploring pilots um, using the MOSA platform. Thank you. Thanks, Dion. Those are some really good examples, I think, of, of how financial inclusion is really important. And you started to touch a bit on some of your work that's interested in gender equity. So are there any specific examples that you could point to that would help our audience think about how digital design, including those payment systems that you mentioned, could reduce biases or advance development goals for women? Yeah, thank you, definitely. So let me go back to the pandemic or we're in the middle of it. So let me, <laughs> let me just um, reflect a little bit on that. Um, we should think about uh, in over the last year, something that was coined, and I'll try to see if I can get it right, she session instead of recession. That phrase was coined to describe what was happening in the global economy, and women were nearly twice as likely as men to lose their jobs. Now there's new data from the International Labor Organization that shows that based on the current recovery, trends, recovery trends are also sexist. Uh, men as a group have already regained the jobs uh, faster than women. And in fact, 2 million more women are expected to leave the workforce this year. So an essential gateway to more equal and inclusive economy is digital financial inclusion and investments in digital public goods. Uh, in a way, a growing body of evidence demonstrates that getting money into the hands of women, and this is what you're pointing at, and allowing them to connect to different forms of of the financial system can lead to long-term benefits, including decision-making power in their households. Through targeted emergency payment systems enabled by a strong, inclusive digital financial, financial systems, governments have bolstered economic activity and supporting women. An example that I alluded to earlier was in India. India coupled its existing payments and identity technology to deliver cash transfer payments to the accounts of 205 million of the country's poorest women. Pakistan expanded its emergency cash transfer program, deploying a whole of government approach that put women at the center of its response in delivering e emergency funds. Gender disaggregated data plays another important role and the fact that certain accounts 
were segregated at geography and gender level allowed many governments to transfer funds quickly into targeted accounts. Again, let's not wait until after the fact, let's design before inclusion by design. A full understanding of the out outcomes of the ways that we respond is something that we should keep in mind. And I'd be remiss if I did not mention the Generation Equality Forum, which took place recently from June 30th to July 2nd in Paris. What an honor to be on the team that supported this foundation-wide initiative. So the Jeff's mission is to focus on fixing the promises related to gender disparities and delivering on the promises made in the famous Beijing conference. The goal is to get experts, grassroots activists, government officials, and business leaders to work together to move from words about gender equality to concrete actions that make a real difference. And to help accelerate progress towards gender equality, our foundation will donate $2.1 billion over the next five years to promote women's economic empowerment, strengthen women and girls' health, and family planning, planning to support women's leadership. When we think about economic empowerment in terms of these priorities, we're thinking about cash, we're thinking about care, as in care for children, and we're thinking Thank about- Thank you so much, Dion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dion. I'm sorry if our connection is, uh, is getting delayed in any way. Um, I really appreciate both the contributions that you and the foundation are making for development, but also these, these initiatives that really will enhance the way that people can be involved and included in identity and payments and in the economy worldwide. It's really going to help everyone around the planet when you have more people involved. Um, I might come back to you for another question later, Dion, but um, I'm going to turn quickly to, uh, to Samantha. Um, Samantha, we are so proud to have you here today with us representing Alaska and your community on the UN's International Day of Indigenous Peoples. Um, many countries and states and cities have large and diverse populations that require engagement for service provision. Now, in your case, you have been working with the state of Alaska to help make voting services and election materials available in about 17 languages, I think. Um, could you share with us some of the challenges of disseminating information via digital tools across remote and rural parts of our country? I'm sure that's relevant to some of Dion's work and to some of um, our other panelists who are working across the globe. Yeah, thank you, Gila. Um, Definitely we'll be reiterating some of what the panelists have said, but first I wanna say thank you for having me um, here as a part of this panel. I'm honored to be amongst such accomplished and uh, remarkable panelists doing this kind of work. Um, but to get to your question, broadband access outside metropolitan areas in Alaska is um, frankly atrocious. Uh, it's slow, it's unreliable, and it is expensive. And so when you are talking about communities with you know, two times as many folks living below the poverty line compared to the rest of the United States. If you create a situation where they have to rely on that internet access for participating in basic democratic processes, it's unacceptable. Um, and so all of the English language and translated resources we create here in this program at the division are presently accessible online or will be in the coming weeks. But um, most importantly, we also send all of our content and our resources to bilingual outreach workers in those communities, um, living in those communities for each election. We do outreach uh, to tribal organizations, to native corporations, community organizations, city clerks offices. Um, you know, we, we air informal PSAs, or excuse me, informational PSAs on community radio stations around the state in multiple languages. And the reality of the situation is that, you know, the language access program is a part of the division of a, of a state government. And so as such is limited by budgetary constraints. And so in these situations, best practices um, state that if you can't do, you know, everything for everyone, you have to do something for everyone. And so in these cases, that's where this kind of extensive informed outreach well in advance of elections uh, becomes so important. The earlier you get started, the better chance you have of disseminating these um, you know, really critical pieces of information to the folks who actually need it, uh, who may otherwise you know, miss out on, on access to that kind of content. And so that being said, in areas where folks do have access to inexpensive or at least 
more affordable and reliable broadband. Um, still, that starting early with informed proactive outreach is still the way to go. And so is, you know, leveraging the, po the, the popularity of um, social media websites across rural Alaska to share our digital tools and resources, you know, utilizing translated uh, captioned videos in addition to our audio PSAs, in addition to written PSAs, um, you know, translated posters with color and culturally relevant references and photos, kind of having this multimodal approach to information dissemination is really crucial. I mean, there's so many things to dissect in, in what you've just told us and in the important work that you're doing. Um, I know that there's a lot of federal government websites that are available in widely spoken languages. I'm really grateful for some of the work that the Government Services Administration, GSA, has done with digital.gov to make USA.gov in Espanol. Um, and specific agencies like the State Department and the IRS produce materials in additional languages, but all of those tend to be written. And as you've mentioned, um, you need to use other mechanisms. So as we think about true inclusion worldwide, what practices have you worked to develop for unwritten or endangered languages, right? I know that you must struggle with some of the nuances of working with different dialects and different languages that might not always have a lot of interpreters. So how do you work through that? That is an excellent question and is something that our translation panels um, engage with. Uh, I'm not joking when I say on a daily basis. Um, so firstly, we do employ translation panels for all of our Alaska native languages for our unwritten and or endangered languages. And so the translation panel model ensures that there are two or more speakers of a language uh, engaging in the translation process. And this allows them to um, you know, cross check their translations to back translate to English for accuracy, um, to certify the accuracy of their translations in the indigenous language. And so this is uh, really necessary and is something that we found to be very successful um, across all of our languages in which we employ this method. For example, our uh, UPIC translation panel currently has nine panel members um, and we're about to have a 10th soon. Uh, and this really helps to account for, again, those dialectical differences that, that you mentioned, um, but as well as differences across generations. Our primary audience for a lot of our Alaska Native translated content is elders. And so it's really crucial that we have, you know, um, culturally appropriate translations that our elders are going to be able to understand and not just our young new language speakers. And so you know, with this, I sort of cannot really emphasize enough having both written and audio translations available and that multimodal access to information has been really key for us. Um, but on the other hand, you know, my background before joining the language assistance program is really in activism and particularly as it does concern indigenous sovereignty, as you mentioned earlier. And so what I think about a lot in this program is the fundamental role that language preservation plays in the sustainability of our native cultures. And so a lot of what I see this program doing is, is, you know, not just providing the necessary and legally mandated equitable access to the democratic process to our Alaska Native peoples, but it also serves to sort of capture this like snapshot of time in our Native languages to, you know, to preserve them exactly, exactly as they are now, but also as they continue to develop and evolve, because it isn't really just about the languages, it's about the communities that use these languages. You know, we're talking about living languages, which I think a lot of people discount when they think about these historically unwritten or these endangered languages. Um, you know, which is all to say that these efforts to translate documents and resources from English into these historically unwritten and endangered languages, to emphasize again, should not be happening within an extractive framework. Um, you know, we really need to think about not just paying these translators, these community members, these elders to do our work for us and then moving on. In place of that, we really need to be thinking critically about transformative work, about embracing a framework of reciprocity in this um, kind of a project. And so, you know, thinking more critically about what we are doing to give back to those communities and that is sort of how I see the resources that we create functioning. Um, you know, though it is their primary purpose, obviously, they are not just for elections, they are for everyone, um, for massive amounts of utility. And especially when we think about, you know, the settler colonial relationship that many of our organizations have had with these marginalized communities, embracing a framework of reciprocity is really an essential step, um, an essential first step 
towards unraveling some of the harms that have been done and um, you know moving towards rebuilding equitable and and more ethical relations. Um, thank you so much, Samantha, not only for the work, but for those comments. I, I really want to maybe open this one up a little bit more to, to everybody, but we have had this variety of speakers representing a diversity of lived and professional experiences with global communities. So what if, from your standpoint, Samantha, what advice would you like to provide to anyone seeking to appropriately use symbols and terminology and engage with communities that might still be healing from legacies of mistrust. And I will open that aspect of legacies of mistrust to any of the speakers on this panel, if you would like to, to comment after Samantha. Thank you again, a really wonderful question. Um, ultimately, and frankly, I think the most important way that we can be showing up for these communities uh, to, to engage with them in, in, a, in an appropriate way is to you know, work harder to hire people from within those communities and pay them a competitive wage. Um, nobody's going to be able to tell you exactly what that community needs, quite like somebody who has lived through the experience of having those needs, um, especially within the sort of context of mistrust that uh, many of us have perhaps experienced. And so, you know, as Cecilia said first, and I think everybody sort of reiterated at one point or another, we need to be designing this infrastructure with these communities and not just for them. Um, even then, though, we do still need to think about the sort of proactive, informed outreach approach. We need to think about asking what these communities need, asking them what will be helpful. Um, each of these communities is different, and as such, their needs will vary. And so when you exist within a settler colonial paradigm, it can be challenging, you know, for, for um, these marginalized peoples to, to ask for help, to ask the government or organization, you know, in charge for help. And sometimes folks don't even have a full grasp of what kind of help it is that they need or even what kind of help they are legally entitled to. And so being proactive about outreach is, uh, excuse me, proactive about outreach is just one of those facets. And the other facet is that when they tell us what, our, what their um, needs are, we need to be showing up and fulfilling those needs, you know, not just paying lip service, um, not just bringing on somebody to do DEI work without actually making any structural changes. Uh, it's been said a lot in these last several months, you know, over and over again by a lot of different people, but to put it plainly, we need to do the work. You're so right, Samantha. Thank you so much for that. Um, does anybody else on the panel wish to, to add on to that, um, that issue of how we can advance and increase Incorporate marginalized communities. I, I, I definitely absolutely love the example you gave, and I think there's so much resonance across so many different areas of inclusion, particularly when you talk about garnering the insights of people and validating it with multiple voices, multiple layers of expertise. I, I think the disability realm um, has, in some ways, uh, you know, a different set of challenges, but it makes two things I think very important when I think about sign language um, uh, as a language that uh, ASL is, you know, every country has its own languages. Not everyone knows that about sign. They think that there's one universal, no. Uh, every country has its own and every region has its own dialect. Um, and really it's the deaf community that really owns that um, as opposed to the hearing community and how do you best engage and make sure that there, there is that reciprocity or whatever that word is, I'm not even gonna try, that's my deaf voice. I'm not gonna, you know what I'm saying though. I think that's incredibly important. But I think the one core element, at least for me, uh, which your last point, is in order to be inclusive and design inclusively, you need to hire talent and you need to hire the experts. You must hire, <laughs> people with disabilities, you must hire people with the language expertise, you gotta hire diverse talent, and not just for some artificial goal, because you want to create a safe and inclusive environment where their expertise can be used, shared and leveraged, and then reward that. Um, and let me be clear about one issue in the, in the disability world, sub-minimum wage. It is still legal to pay people with disabilities sub-minimum wage, which means cents on the dollar. No, people deserve, I think the word minimum wage is there for a reason. Um, we've eliminated it from our, from Microsoft environment. We've completely eliminated it a couple of years ago. P bringing people in 
safety, equity, equality leads to inclusion. Um, and so those processes, I think we can all learn a lot. Um, I look forward to learning more from you, Samantha. I, I have a few uh, thoughts to contribute as well. I mean, it's hard to go uh, after Samantha and Jenny have outlined such a vibrant um, and truthful description of, of what's needed. I'll just uh, try to go back to what Cecilia mentioned and, and mentioned that the vision for a world where you can think of a poor woman living in the United States, Latin America, South Asia, Africa, wherever, and who can have access to an ID and secure financial payments to pay her school's child fee, school fees, to get the groceries in the door, to support a small business, and to build up a personal credit history that will empower, further empower women and the entire family to survive is something that worth giving great thought to and putting resources behind and working together with other others uh, to make happen. I just want to mention that um, if we think about inclusion by design, we can make this happen. And I just wanted to, to say, um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you to, to think about how to do this in a collective and inclusive way. Thank you very much. I'm gonna just quickly turn. We had one audience question that I'd like to try and get into. Um, some Elizabeth Goodman asks, I'd love to hear more about the intersection between web accessibility and broadband access. That is, how can we make sure that government services for people are available who have trouble getting to offices in person or uh, have to be home on dial-up? So maybe this is a question for uh, for Cecilia or for Tamika or Samantha, whoever would like to, Samantha, Cecilia, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll attempt it. It's a great, great question. I mean, in some ways, these issues show up in different buckets, but like broadband is a matter of, of kind of equity policy. And it's the, it's the underlying infrastructure. It's as important as roads, bridges, you know, like a, name your basic fundamental infrastructure. Boy, did we get a lesson in that in the course of the last year, right? Broadband was a, an equity issue in education and it has been for a long time, but it kind of, we all got it <laughs> at some level on the course of the last year. It, it was true before the last year, but we could see it in a different way. And so broadband is just straight up, if you're interested in educational equity in the United States, you, you, that's, it's something that we have to address and which I'm grateful to see that the current administration recognizes and, and is, um, it has proposals that is putting forward as part of its um, infrastructure um, ideas. Um, but having said that again, I, you know, to reiterate what I said before, you can't assume, like let's assume we're living in a world where everybody has access to technology and everybody's got a device. We don't actually live in that world. But I, I, I worry that too often policymakers assume that one, that we're in that world and two, then it's just a matter of, make, of, of creating the technology and then people will access the thing. We know that that's not true with respect to, for example, the CARES Act that um, to Mike and I have colleagues who demonstrated that when Congress passed the CARES Act and, and made decisions about the pipes through which they were gonna be sending dollars into people's pockets, that as many as 10 million people got missed because they chose pipes that never reached those people. Um, so it, so again, this the assumption that kind of technology is the way only works if you're starting with people and working your way back towards the policy rather than being a policymaker making assumptions about what's going to work to reach people. And Gila, if I can just build on what Cecilia said there, we are you know, hopefully hours, days away from passage of an infrastructure bill that is going to go further than we've ever gone before in trying to solve the broadband access issue. But that on its own is necessary. It's not sufficient to ensure that people can actually access government services uh, and do so in an accessible way. The countries that are doing this well have cracked the code. So we know this has been done. In Estonia, the only public service that you need to show up for in person is getting married. Everything else can be done online. 
that's a pretty good benchmark. You know, if, if we get to that point in the United States, we'll be doing a few things right. And so we need to think through what are the systems that need to be in place? What type of infrastructure needs to be in place in order to ensure that every single American, regardless of who they are, regardless of where they are, regardless of what language they speak, is going to be able to access the services that provide the raw material for building a successful life. Uh, and, and that is a mission that all of us in this community need to be taking to heart every single day. There's one last thing that I, I was thinking about as all of you were speaking, and, and Dion might have some expertise in this, because when we think about people using a feature, an accessibility feature or a translation feature or a multimodal tool or connecting via dialect connection, how do we make sure that governments and developers incorporate those features that also integrate privacy and cybersecurity protection so that we're not uh, being, people don't feel that they can't use those features without sacrificing something. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, you know, I'll go circle back to the, to the good old adage of inclusion by design. This works with privacy, cybersecurity, and consumer protection as well. Uh, so they're all vital. And the basic rules of transparency, fair treatment, effective recourse, and service delivery are all essential tools that we need to have in place in order to effectively make sure everybody's, um, everybody's receiving the services that we want them to receive, including those which Tamika just outlined. Um, and I think if we work together to develop those tools in the ecosystem, we'll make sure that we're doing the best we can. We'll do a good job. Thank you. Well, our hour has certainly moved along quickly and it has been such an informative and enlightening session. I have learned so much from the five of you and I know our audience will have picked up new knowledge in this past hour. Um, while many parts of the developed world rely heavily on technology and on access to digital infrastructure, the reality is there's still a digital divide that exists between the numerous individuals and households and communities that lack internet access and those that are even able to capitalize on connectivity and technology um, as it advances. And even among those with connectivity and digital access, the gap still exists. Uh, as you all mentioned, if just assuming that someone has internet doesn't mean that they actually have access to the information or that they know how to use it. So today we've explored how organizations can consider their own digital infrastructure and platform design in new ways. Uh, we've talked about disabilities, those from marginalized communities, women and gender minorities, and groups in rural and remote areas. Um, I invite everyone to check back on New America's Digital Impact and Governance Initiative website for the recording of this session and a write-up, including some of the resources our speakers have referenced today. I wanna to thank Jennifer Austin for her ASL interpretation today. And I wanna thank our panelists for all of your participation and all of our audience members striving to make the world a better place. Thanks, and we hope to see you all at a future New America event. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>